Hey, Rocco, we on it. Let's make it interesting. Got a little small hole here, girl. Stick with me. Let's just rock right over here. Keep me off that way. Bring your in back around. Get on it. Get on top of it. The mighty James flows through Henrico County like a great provider of wealth and opportunity. Early settlers in the New World saw that shipping goods and services along its waterways would be beneficial. This is a story of triumph and tragedies as we look at Henrico's view of the James River and Canal Canal. Cities, our East Coast cities, many of them are where they are now is because that's where the falls are and that's where you could have power for your mills back then, water power. That's why Richmond is where it is because of, of several reasons. Your ships could get up that far. You had power for your mills. The, the whole problem was it, if you lived further up river than the tidewater where you could have a ship next to your plantation and you were in, if you couldn't get your farm produce somewhere to market, and it wasn't any use having a farm or growing anything. You could, so people were pretty desperate to have a way, good way to get their tobacco, particularly because that was the cash crop then. You can only go so far on the rivers in Virginia until you hit the fall line. You can't get up them very easily. You can come down them. People tried it in canoes, large boats, uh, shallow draft. It didn't work terribly well. But in 1771, it was a big flood. It was a record flood. Did all kinds of damage in Virginia. But at that, at that time, they were using dugout canoes to haul tobacco. Well, this flood of 1771 washed away these dugout canoes. The two Rucker brothers in Amherst County uh, invented a new style of boat, which was this kind right here called the Rucker Bateau, or the Market Boat, or the Tobacco Boat, had several names to it. Gibson Hobbs, a historian, canal historian up in Lynchburg, realized that, that they were spelling Bateau with two T's around this part of the country. That was this, this kind of boat with two T's. If you were up toward Canada or down in Louisiana, you had one T with the French spelling, and it meant a different kind of boat, usually. Uh, there are lots of boats called Bateaus. That's why we call these the James River Bateau. Uh, a Bateau people probably had to be pretty rugged. They had to be trustworthy to some extent, because if you had a farm or plantation sending your tobacco out, you didn't want, it, uh, didn't want the boatman to run into rocks all the time, smash your boat up and ruin your farm price. So they had to be pretty responsible people. The Bateaus was the main thing that got got this country really going. If it hadn't been for that, we'd have still been fighting, trying to get freight moved. We would have been 50 to 75 years long across in the mountains. I'm, I'm the captain and I also run the French sweep. The man that runs the French sweep, he has to read the river and hopefully he carries us in the right direction. When you're going between two rocks, you're looking for a V. The deeper the V, the wider the hole is. Uh, that's what you want, that's what you want, is a, is a good deep V to put these boats through. The other jobs is polers. They, they pole the boat and they help guide, they help guide the uh, boat down through the rapids. Um, this is um, back sweepman. We're in the back sweep. The back sweep takes care of pretty much from uh, the front sweep handles about the first five feet of the boat and then the back sweep handles the rest of the boat. So the front sweepman's job is basically to, to get the boat into whatever spot we want to go and then the back sweepman takes it from there. Um, generally on the back sweep what I'll do is when we're going through rapids, he will tell me wherever he wants to go. Sit boot! And I'll put his end into it and then after I get him through then I'll bring my end around. These boats are wonderful because they, they give so much and you can just make those really quick turns. A piece of cake. 
1785, the Virginia Assembly passed an act incorporating the James River Company to improve navigation along the James River. Ten years later, a canal system was built around the fall line, making it one of the first in America. George Washington's concept was to bypass the falls at Richmond, but a heck of a lot of work went, went on all the way up to Ravana, all the way to Lynchburg to make these waterways pliable for bateau. After the Revolution, George Washington was especially concerned that if there wasn't a, a communication link like Bateau, some kind of transportation over the Allegheny Mountains, that uh, the 13 colonies would, would be sitting there unconnected to the Ohio Valley, and they would run off and be French or Spanish. And there were Russians coming in on the west coast of the United States. They didn't know what was going to happen. You know, the British in the north, Canada. So. Uh, George Washington decided to open up the West, the West being the Ohio country, and to get to that you had to cross the Appalachian Mountains. The easiest way to do that and the, the, the way that worked with the least amount of breakage was with boats. So the idea was to create a canal that would go around all of the rapids in Richmond and create an environment that would economically benefit everybody from Richmond on upstream as well. That was done, George Washington actually came into Richmond and passed under the, uh, the canal arch. Two, two canals around the falls in Richmond were, were open to navigation, and that was before the one on the Potomac, before any of the other canals in the United States. We liked that, and George Washington was still president of the company, honorary president at that time. The kind of navigation system they built on the James was called a sluice navigation. Whenever you had a rock ledge or a lot, a lot of rocks, you would clear out a channel wide enough for the boat. If you wanted to blast a, a rock out of the way, you had to hand drill a hole and stick some black powder in there. It could be in a waterproof bag. And you, you lit it and then ran away as fast as you could. They called them blowers, the people who, who, who lit the fuses. And some, there was a, supposed to be a high turnover of blowers. Uh, they weren't all blown up. Some of them just ran away and said, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> we read about that. <laughs> just what we see now, what we're going over, uh, are pretty much where the boats are going is, is where the channels were blasted out. Ready? Great piece of work. By 1835, the James River and Canal and Company formed intending to complete the canal system along the river for going the dangerous trek on Bateau. The company, one of the largest of its time, did finally achieve Washington's dream of the Ohio Connection. Although the canal never fully reached the Ohio River, it did reach Buchanan in 1851, where goods were taken by road and steamship along the Kanawha River, finally reaching the Ohio. The bateau men got a slightly bad reputation because the uh, people living on the James, they wanted a more reliable means of transportation. Th this one out in the middle of the river, if it was too low you couldn't go, if it was too high you couldn't go, if it was ice you couldn't go, and it was dangerous running through the sluices and you could only carry as much as one in one of these boats. Would, originally they are they're usually 60 feet long. So everybody knew that if they had a canal, Canals were the super highways of that time. If you, you wanted to have a really super transportation route, you'd, you'd build a canal, dug out uh, with flat water in it. When you went up and down, because of the gradient, instead of going over a falls, you went through a lock. Uh, it was a very safe thing. You had boats 90 feet long, 15 feet wide. You could carry a lot more in it, and it'd be towed by horses or mules. Uh, Joseph Carrington Cabell got it in his mind that he wanted Virginia to, to have a gateway to the west. And the only way in his mind that could be done was via water. Via water meant via canal. By, by 1835, he had the company all under charter. By 1840, they had this canal built. The James River 
was the eastern was to be the eastern terminus of this uh, of this 500 mile route, this gateway to the west, and the Kanawha River, which which runs into the Ohio, north of Charleston, was going to be the western terminus. So that's the reason it's called the James River and Kanawha. The canal was dug, and due to the elevation change, you have to have a series of locks that allow the boats to go up in, in discrete increments. The, the lock system on the, on the river doesn't elevate a boat much more than, I think, 10 feet at most. Well, Bocher Dam is one of the, one of the early uh, dams on the canal. Bocher's Dam was uh, completed in 1824, I believe, and the idea was to um, put water into the James River Kanawha Canal. The thing was built out of stone. It replaced Fore's Fish Dam. It had a grist mill on it and a lock to allow the boats through. But once you got into that uh, lock system, that canal system, you, you were out of the river completely and all the way to downtown Richmond into, into the Great Turning Basin. If you just go visit one of these locks and just, just take a look, just take a long look at the stones, every single one of them were hand-hewn. They fit together beautifully. There's no mortar in them. And you think how they did this. The original canal, 1780s, 1790s canal, you had slave labor. But it, the James River and Kanawha Canal, you had all the immigrants coming over from Ireland and Scotland. You had a tremendous influx of Germans into the Richmond area. And a lot of the families that we know of today, our friends here in town, are descended from these people who originally came over to build the James River and Kanawha Canal. Uh, but these beautiful stone-dressed creation that's been here for what, what, 170 years. The first canal built in the 1790s was nothing like this. This canal is 15 feet wide, the, uh, or this canal lock, and the other locks were much smaller because, uh, because it was before the days of, of uh, canal boats. When the, canal, the slack water system was built, you had very large boats, uh, the equivalent of tractor trailer trucks of the day. Um, these things were basically roll on, roll off cargo boats. Um, they were pulled by a two mule power engine. The third boat was a packet boat. This carried small packets, hence the name. It also carried passengers. If you had a a grandmother who lived in Henrico and you lived in Richmond, you could hop on a canal boat and, and you'd just uh, go in style. Can't you imagine how lovely it would have been to have been on a packet boat? And they were beautifully appointed inside. Uh, the, the food was excellent. Just have, have these horses and mules pull you along at about four miles an hour. I, I, to, uh, to the modern day mind, to my mind, that just seems so refreshing and, and elegant. And, and that's what the, uh, the people of Enrico enjoyed. At first, the, uh, if you're a passenger on a packet boat, you got your dinner free if you were there when they had dinner. But uh, people would jump on at dinner time and they'd eat and pay a penny and then jump off again, and walk home. <laughs> so they had to charge separately for dinner after a while. They, they, they caught on to that. Uh, and you had uh, the ability to sleep overnight in a uh, comfortable con uh, condition, more or less like a, a Greyhound bus of the day, only you could get up and move around and uh, stay, actually sit on top of the boat. And there was a speed limit on the canal itself. The boat captains had been known to, um, shall we say, bend the rules a little bit, and there was betting as to which captain could outrun the other one going to Lynchburg. The sleeping compartments were divided by a red velvet curtain. It was always red and apparently it was always velvet. The women had compartment in the front and the men had a compartment in the rear. The canal boat excavation we did in the 1980s in downtown Richmond showed that one of the packet boats had a uh, flush toilet in the front end of it. And hanging alongside the mirror was a communal hairbrush or comb 
as well as a communal toothbrush, which you and all your neighbors could use to, uh, to clean your teeth. Washington's idea of the canal as a commercial entity for opening up the West uh, was certainly true and did its purpose. The local traffic, on the other hand, could move his material down to the canal, offload it on the boats, and basically connect to a global market. There are uh, several uh, mine areas in Henrico, the Gaten Pits, um, Deep Run, on, on the border where you have Tuckahoe Creek, they're on both sides of the creek there. It was in the 1820s, a canal a company was formed to build a canal system for bateaus up into the Tuckahoe Creek mine region. The boats could come down, go in, into the, the James River, and then later on the canal came along and they could go into the canal, go to Richmond. And a lot of the boats, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe even a dozen, boats that we dug up or saw parts of in the Richmond Basin where had coal in them. The boats, because they didn't bounce around, did not take big pieces of coal and make smaller pieces of coal, which didn't work quite so well in your coal grade, a lot of more dust, so they were a lot uh, safer on the, the end product, like carrying eggs around. If you, the less joggling you do, the better. So the, uh, the Tucko Canal is built basically as one of the first outlets for commercial um, uh, coal production in the country. And now that company that, that built the navigation system up in the Tucko Creek was one of the most profitable companies, canal companies in Virginia. Probably the most profitable one. Most, most canal companies never made any profit. James River and Kanawha Company really didn't get anywhere. It served the heart of Virginia, but it didn't get to coal mines or the Ohio River or someplace where you had a tremendous lot of traffic coming down. It served Virginia for a long time before the railroads came here, but they didn't make any money. Well, canals were really maintenance intensive. You had the, you had the periodic floods, that, which would just decimate the, the canals themselves. Canals really made sense up until about 1835 or 1840 uh, because the railroads had not come into being. James River and Canal Company uh, was uh, started in 1835 and this canal uh, was completed to Richmond in 1840, right parallel to the development of the railroads. Joseph Carrington Cavill, he was a canal man all the way. Even when railroads were obvious, the best uh, transportation, he was pitted against Claudius Crozet, the preeminent railroad, early railroad man in the state of Virginia. And they were at loggerheads. Cabell was more powerful. He basically booted uh, Claudius Crozet out. Just this complete stubbornness. We allowed him to be so wrong, and Virginia missed out because they weren't getting the type of industrial evolution. Uh, they were sedentary while, while states to the north were forging ahead. Here, the canal, by 1850, it's up to Buchanan, Virginia. It's a couple of hundred miles. These railroads started to be built in the 1850s, People dropped the canal. The canal was passe. It was too expensive. It was too slow. Uh, railroads were much more efficient. In the Supreme Ironer, you'll see photographs of packet boats, freight boats, with canal workers, railroad workers, and carrying railroad ties that actually they sort of contributed to their own demise, built their own gallows, as it were. So 1865, it's an operation again. It's, it, it doesn't make any money. It's a financial disaster. But it just keeps plugging along until 1880. And the death knell of the James River and Kanawha Canal is when it was bought by, the right of way was bought by the railroad, and they basically put the railroad tracks on the towpaths. The Battle of Water versus Iron was over, and the James River and Kanawha Canal was deemed a failure. Although the canal did not succeed commercially,
its legacy still reminds us of the people with good intentions and an undying vision of a passage to the west. Today, Henrico residents and visitors can still view the canal and Boschers Dam and dream of what used to be along this remarkable waterway.